Good morning. I'm Sana, and you're listening to Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR 91.7 FM. Every Monday morning, I'm joined by experts from across the country who are investigating our most pressing social issues and common curiosities. Over the next hour, you'll learn about their inspirations, motivations, and of course, what they know about the world around us. So grab that cup of coffee and get ready for a fun and insightful conversation. This year marks the 55th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King's legacy and untimely death looms heavy in our history as a nation, but particularly heavy in our own history as Memphians. We are all probably familiar with the photo capturing Dr. King laying on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel, several men pointing towards the direction of a gunshot, and a man kneeling over Dr. King's body. But we are probably less familiar with the story of that man, how he came to be on the balcony with Dr. King and other civil rights leaders on that day, and what happened in the days and years that followed. This morning, I'm joined by Lita mccullough Seletsky, the author of The Kneeling Man, My Father's Life as a Black Spy Who Witnessed the Assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Lita is a National Endowment for the Arts 2022 Creative Writing Fellow, a litigator turned essayist and memoirist. Her work has been featured in The Atlantic, New York Times, O, The Oprah Magazine, The Washington Post, and elsewhere. Her essay, The Man in the Picture, published in O, The Oprah Magazine, was selected as a notable essay in Best American Essays 2019. Lita holds a BA from Northwestern University and a JD from the George Washington University Law School. Good morning, Lita. Thanks so much for joining us. Good morning, Sana. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, I am absolutely. First, just your book, phenomenal. Um, It took me on a a roller coaster of emotions, but also um, a very important walk through history um, of our nation. And then, you know, as a Memphian, of course, the history of our city and the way that you have told this story, these truths, right, um, is also so captivating. And we'll maybe talk a little bit about the writing process um, later, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for, for writing this book. And I know it's very personal to you, Um, But it also, I think, tells an important story for all of us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you for reading it. And I'm so glad that it resonated with you. Yes, absolutely. I mean, especially I think as a Memphian, there's so much history about our city that we don't even know that we, I think, should be taught in our schools, but we have to go to outside sources to really learn our own history. And your book, I see as part of that history that we should know that we have a responsibility to understand. And um, as we have this conversation, I think listeners will really get a, a better idea of why I think this book is so important. But I wanted to start by reading a passage from the book, which I think kind of really sums up some of the main themes. Um, And it really, it it struck me. So I'll I'll just read it. Um, It says, and I'm on page 243. And it says, for my family, the assassination was a lifelong wound, something we didn't touch for fear of aggravating it. I imagine the same was true for many. Somehow it managed to become part of my lived experience, though I I hadn't even been born when it happened. It had always been there, like the background of a base relief, maybe even encoded in my DNA alongside other trauma from generations past. It hurt. And then later in that passage, I thought about how I jumped into my dad's story, not knowing what I'd find and afraid of what I might uncover. At first, I thought the fear was driven by the conspiracy theories involving dad, but I came to realize it went deeper, down to the heart of his identity and by extension, part of mine. What his story really was, who he'd hurt and how much he'd been hurt. I was afraid of what I'd have to feel. Oh, when I read that, I mean, especially that part of like, this is a story to some who are reading it, right? It's a story of history. It's a story of this man in the picture. Um, But for you, of course, it's a very personal story about your dad and about you and your family. Um, But I think even in that passage, it points to this is, you know, something that has impacted us. And I think, again, particularly as Memphians in a way that maybe we don't even realize, but yet it is very much encoded in our DNA as Memphians. Yes, absolutely. Um, And yeah, I think that there's so many layers to this. You know, it's first of all, it's a very personal story, as you say, you know, um, something that in my family 
we didn't talk about that. My mm-hmm. father, you know, aside from his congressional testimony about the assassination um, and then his related cooperation with congressional investigators, other than that, he did not discuss the assassination for 55 years. And yeah. so I think that is a testament to the the trauma, the pain and the grief. And so in our family, you know, that was kind of this chasm uh, of silence. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there's that personal level, um, you know, radiating out from my father to me, to our immediate family, and then, uh, you know, zooming out a little bit to our extended family. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think, though, the other piece of this is for the city. Yeah, the um, the trauma that's there for us as Memphians to carry that. Um, And then I think, you know, zooming out even further, you know, for the country, for our society Mm -hmm. um, and, and for world history as well. Yeah, I mean, in in your book, you also write, um, I became the keeper of a secret and betraying his trust, your father's trust was unthinkable. And so I think about that as even in your childhood, learning the many different secrets, some of which you weren't even aware of that you were keeping. Um, And then now writing this book where here it is, a lot of secrets and, and heaviness coming out. And I'm wondering if you could just share for our listeners a little bit about how you came to decide to even, you know, ask your dad the question, let alone, you know, write this book. Yes. So for much of my life, I actually was trying to get as far away from this story as possible. Um, Bit by bit, I learned um, about my father's uh, role and how he came to be in that famous photograph of the assassination. Mm -hmm. I always knew from an early age that that was my father kneeling over Dr. King. And I always knew that My father had been a Memphis police officer, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't until I was a high school student. um, I think I was a a junior at Craigmont and I was an avid newspaper reader. So I was reading the commercial appeal and I saw an article that said that, you know, there was this black Memphis police officer who had infiltrated a black militant group called the Invaders. And at this time, you know, I was, um, you know, I was just kind of awakening into a political consciousness. And I had been reading all these books about the Black Panthers, um, whom I really admired, you know, Huey Newton, I had read um, one of the Panther memoirs. And so, you know, to see that my father was kind of on the other side of of a movement like that, which I kind of, you know, to my mind, the invaders were kind of like Memphis's version of Black Panthers in a mm-hmm. sense. You know, I was really shocked and um, appalled. I couldn't understand how a Black man could be working for the Memphis police, off, uh, police department to give them information about what a group like that was doing, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I found it really painful. And so I just essentially compartmentalized it, moved on with my life, you know, left Memphis altogether, you know, went off to college, went off to law school, you know, moved around. And it was only in 2010. So by this time, you know, I'm working in a law firm. I've had um, a couple of kids. And it was after the birth of my uh, second son, who's now the middle child, that you know, I, I I was off from work and actually I'd stepped back to part time anyway after, you know, having the second child just to have more work life balance. But when you have that time to sit with something mm. and you don't have a lot of noise kind of crowding out those deeper um, uh, kind of thoughts and, and what really matters to you and what's really on your spirit, you know, that having that time to step away from what was keeping me busy had, you know, it caused me to think more about my father's story and Mm -hmm. how I didn't know much of anything about it. And what I did know in my mind painted a sinister picture. And Mm -hmm. then I thought, okay, well now, you know, I had these two sons. What do I tell them about their grandfather? Yeah. And I didn't want them to live with those silences as I had. So that's what spurred me to say, it's time to stop running from this. Let's find out what really happened. And no matter what those facts are, they need to be known. 
Mm, yeah. I mean, what you just said, like you didn't want your sons to live in those silences, this secrecy and silence, but also pain that was unspoken in your family, I think as well. And so to take that that determination to say, okay, I'm going to stop running and I'm going to at least start to try to figure out like what, what was going on, how my dad thought about this. But in the end, I mean, you not only talk to your father, you talk to a lot of other people and did a lot of research to really understand this moment and try to get as much perspective on what was happening at this particular time. Yes, that's right. Because talking to my father was, of course, a huge piece of this. You know, I mean, I interviewed him, you know, from 2015 through 2022, and I recorded all those interviews. I transcribed them. I put them in binders. I had to create my own primary sources um, mm -hmm. because the facts that are in those interviews aren't necessarily somewhere else. So I had to document that. But that was only one piece of it. The other piece was corroborating what he told me and not just taking his word for it, but part of the job also is to talk to other people, get some other perspectives. Um, and there's a lot of research that goes into that. Of course, um, you know, I had to file a Freedom of Information Act request to get certain FBI documents that are relevant to the book. I um, found a couple of invaders and talked to them, met with uh, one of them, Kobe Smith, who was very gracious. Um, mm -hmm. So we had a long, great conversation um, and I had to read a lot of background material because this is such an immense array of topics. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, you have the sanitation strike, but um, larger than that, you know, you have the context of Memphis and Memphis history, the black community. You have the invaders. You have, um, of course, Dr. King and the SCLC. So there was just a lot. And um, I mean, I would say one of the biggest parts of the job was kind of knowing what was in the scope and mm -hmm. what was outside of the scope of what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I mean, for readers, once for listeners who, you know, maybe become readers or, or even listeners on an audio book, I mean, the, the way that you're able to take us back to that time period, I think is really important, right? To set the scene, to give us a, a sense of what was happening on the ground. And again, like as a Memphian, I just really appreciated learning more about my city, right? And and what was happening um, throughout those years and getting a sense of, you know, the political landscape, the social landscape, um, and how Memphians were feeling at that time. So I really appreciated all of the research and all of the different voices that you've included in this book. Um, and I think that speaks to the story that you were telling, but also you said something important. You said, you know, these conversations with your dad and the other folks you talked to, you know, aren't necessarily part of the historical record. Um, and so I also see this book very much as amending the historical record as it has, you know, been written or the things that we have thought so far. And that is another theme in the book of saying, you know, whose story, whose perspective, and very specifically, what angle, right? One of the questions that you talk about in the book. And so I thought it was really important that this book is you know, is part of the historical record now. Yes, I agree completely that, um, you know, there is this question, you know, who gets to decide what's part of the historical record? What should be included? What is important? Who are the authorities on um, various matters? And I think that so often the very people whose histories are being told are actually excluded from the telling. Mm -hmm. And I have a serious problem with that. And so it's so important to me that marginalized people are speaking for themselves and not being, um, not having their stories extracted and translated and remixed um, for uh, other purposes. You know, I think that people should have, um, the ability to tell their own stories and to be heard. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you do such a beautiful job in this book. And we're going to get more into the meat of the story, but let's take a quick break. You're listening to Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR 91.7 FM. I'm Sanaa, and this is Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR 91.7 FM. And this morning, we are joined by Lita mccullough Selesky, author of The Kneeling Man, My Father's Life as a Black Spy Who Witnessed the Assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. 
Now, Lita, before the break, you were talking about how it was, you know, difficult for you to kind of reconcile like your understanding of your father as a black man and also being a spy who was info who had infiltrated the invaders and who was reporting back to the Memphis Police Department. And you know, for me as a reader, I also was having the struggle of like on one hand, like rooting for your dad in, in certain ways, right? And thinking about all, you know, him being a police officer um, and also the different things that he did throughout his career um, to advance racial equity, but also within policing. So I'm like having this like moment of like, okay, what, you know, like how am I even feeling <laughs> about this? So I can only imagine for you um, thinking through this. Um, and I'm wondering if you could tell us just a little bit more about um, your dad and also how he even came to be a police officer and then in this position. Yes. Um, so my father was um, born one of 12 children in 1944 in Tibbs, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, so this is what he came out of. And it's pretty extraordinary to look back at how he came into the world and then to, to trace um, his path from that place to, you know, ultimately the Central Intelligence Agency. Right. Um, and in fact, I mean, that's something that people, I think, sometimes find suspicious or sinister that, okay, well, how did he go from the Memphis Police Department to the CIA, you know, this guy from Mississippi, like what was really going on? Mm -hmm. But what I learned was that, you know, you know, obviously we know that 1944 Mississippi is not going to be a hospitable social uh, or any kind of economic, any kind of environment for black people. And so, um, like I said, he was one of 12, um, grew up in a very um, poor household. And um, his mother got sick when he was a very young child, which destabilized the household. They fell on even harder times than they were on to begin with, which it's, you know, in his mind, everything was okay, you know, mm -hmm. at the beginning. And then with his mother's illness and uh, subsequent death, um, everything was destabilized. They ended up sharecropping for a while, moving from place to place. He um, lost a couple of siblings to, uh, or well, actually three, to early, uh, very tragic deaths. Um, so there's a lot of trauma that comes along mm -hmm. with that, not to mention, you know, being in that Jim Crow environment. But he always had within himself this belief that if he did the right thing, you know, and especially, you know, if he got an education mm -hmm. that he could escape that environment and really live out the potential of yeah. who he was as a human being. So, and he loved school, he loved learning. And so he ended up entering school late because of the, um, the disorder within the household. I mean, they literally did not have clothes to wear to school. They didn't have shoes to wear to school, but that ended up changing. And so um, he, uh, his father remarried um, and his stepmother kind of got everything back um, on track. And so he went through school, did great, excelled. But, um, and, but as he got older, he realized that there was no way in the world that he could afford to go to college mm -hmm. without the GI Bill, which a lot of people are in that position of, you know, um, they go into the military because it offers these fantastic benefits. And one major one is the ability to go to school um, mm -hmm. with the GI Bill. So he registered for the selective service and um, ended up getting sort of, um, you know, kind of tricked yeah. <laughs> out of finishing high school. And I don't want to give away too much. Right. Book. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of twists and turns. But what I'm trying to communicate is this that my father, you know, and this is a through line in the book, was uh, and is someone who really has faith in kind of, you know, doing the right thing and, mm -hmm. and trying to reap the benefits of that. And someone who is moving in the world with a sense of honor, personal honor and duty and faith in, um, in, in his ability to prosper in doing those things. 
But um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, just that little snippet of, of, you know, his life, I think is so very revealing. And I mean, there are many, many twists and turns to this. I mean, obviously. So, yes. you know, going from this beginning to the Memphis Police Department, which did not hire a lot of Black people in right. 1987. So just that piece. And then, you know, being in the police department, ultimately how he wound up at the Lorraine. And then from there to the, you know, the world's premier civilian spy agency, you know, is it, it, it required um, quite the um, array of changes and quite the voyage um, through history and through through life. Yeah. I mean, one of the the threads in the book is just all of the different things that are happening in his life that are quite unbelievable and unexplainable, but that lead him to these different positions and throughout, you know, his time as a police officer and then in the CIA, you know, the sense that I got of him was, as you kind of mentioned, you know, a very, uh, a man full of, of, of a vision, right, of of justice really, and but also a very disciplined man, a very principled man. And for me, again, I was like having this difficulty of like reconciling like his role as a spy, right? And then also, you know, working, um, you know, with the CIA. But, you know, as you're able to share um, some of the, I think, really important things that he was able to do in his positions as far as um, you mentioned, you know, later on the, in the book that he ended up taking um, the lead on minority rec- recruiting in the CIA and bringing on board more than 60 Black officers. Officers, and we're talking, you know, at a time again where even though we're supposed to be, you know, whatever integrated, we're supposed to have, you know, be moving towards some sense of maybe racial equality or something. We know that that's not the case then and now. And so even thinking about that um, or, you know, later when he files the EEOC complaint and the different changes that he's able to institute. And so it really as I'm you know, reading your book, I'm thinking about like, how do we create positive social change? How do we create an equitable society? And, you know, even one of the reflections, I think, from your father, um, or you reflecting on on his role of thinking about, like, are we able to change systems from within? um, Should we be taking other or additional, maybe concurrent actions? And that's another question that I think for me in reading your book is very much about um, institutional racism, structural racism, but also how we create change. Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, there are a couple of uh, kind of major forces here. Really, I would say maybe three main kind of major forces. First, there's his own personal agency. You know, Mm -hmm. he's making decisions. He's making choices. He is, you know, he's got a set of circumstances in front of him. And so he's making the best choice that he's got, you know, by his lights. But separate and apart of that, uh, separate and apart from that, as you mentioned, um, is the, you know, these systems Mm -hmm. that are in place um, that are so much bigger than, his ability to choose. I mean, there are certain paths in front of him that are there or that are, you know, barred from him by these systems. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, the question is, you know, how much can we change these systems by playing along with those systems and being Mm -hmm. part of those systems? You know, and then I think, you know, another force kind of in the background of all this, you know, that I think is hinted at and is sort of a thread through the book is this idea of the uncanny. I mean, there's certain Mm -hmm. things that happen that just feel like fate almost. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, this is always a question now as much as ever can the system be changed from the inside, you know, and, um, I think that it's really interesting because when he got into these positions where he could affect decisions, like you mentioned, the uh, minority recruitment programs and the Mm -hmm. EEOC um, complaint, but he was penalized for that. Yeah. And it, it inhibited his ability to you know, to, to be in positions, uh, of power where he, where he could really make 
the changes that he wanted to see. So it can be a catch 22. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was thinking of as, you know, you share this story of your father and, and, you know, there's some formal policies and roadblocks that, you know, prohibit him from moving forward. Then there are a lot of informal practices as well. A lot of changes in leadership from presidents on Dan, right, that are impacting his ability um, to do you know, what's right in his mind, right? And and really thinking about moving um, some of these organizations forward. And so I was, I think it is also a story of, as you mentioned, some of the personal agency that we have, but also the realities of the systems that we live within. So I mean, so many different threads throughout this book. Um, and I was really struck by the way you present, I think a very balanced um, portrayal of your dad and every, you know, everything that was happening and also the other people, um, the other kind of main characters during this time, um, because I wasn't aware of, you know, all the conspiracy theories as they relate to your dad in particular, right? We're aware probably of a lot of conspiracy theories <laughs> around the assassination of Dr. King, uh, but I wasn't aware about, you know, your dad specifically. And you give us a glimpse between some of the different um, hearings that he had to testify at. And for me, also hinted at how it really did impact your family as well. Yes, it did, because... You know, I mean, for me, for example, his role, you know, at, at the scene of that assassination was, I mean, it really came down to a question of identity. Mm -hmm. You know, who is he really? What kind of man is he? What kind of Black person is he? You know, and so it, um, it really did affect us, I think, that you know, much as a name is passed down, you know, he's yeah. McCullough and now I'm Lita McCullough Seletsky, but, you know, these legacies are passed down. And so I think it is important to, to really get the facts and get the truth and really understand a legacy and all of its complexity. And so, yes, I mean, his experiences even though unspoken, directly impact, uh, impacted me. Mm -hmm. And I think that that had a ripple effect on, on, the, on the family. You know, every McCullough, <laughs> you know, or every relative is in some way impacted by um, this man in this photograph and mm -hmm. what his role in history really was. Mm -hmm. I love that piece about identity, because that is also another thread in your book, both for your father, right? Um, you know, you write in Going Undercover, he had to split himself in two, and maybe even more than just in, in two, particularly as he's going undercover. Um, and so that really struck me in thinking about his own identity. Um, and again, as you mentioned, kind of just in your brief bio of him and kind of giving listeners just a little bit about his story, you know, coming from Mississippi and then to Memphis, right? And then, you know, being in the army, being a police officer, being in the CIA, I'm thinking about all these different ways that he's probably wrestling with his own self and how he's thinking about his impact. And then, you know, another thing that you do in the book is you also talk about your own identity, right? How understanding this part of, you know, your your dad and your family's history is also having you kind of rethink some of, of who you are as well. And I really appreciated you sharing some of those insights into how you are wrestling with, you know, learning more about your dad and, and who he was, but also thinking through, you know, your own position as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think looking back, having that big chasm of silence and not really understanding his legacy and feeling kind of ambivalent at best about all that I knew, mm -hmm. what it did was it created in me this feeling of rootlessness, mm -hmm. you know, not really feeling all that secure in in my roots and where I came from. I mean, as his daughter and as a Memphian as well. And so one thing that, you know, working on this book, doing the research and, and talking to my father and learning about the story and really kind of putting it together, what that did was 
it made me feel so much more rooted and grounded and proud. And also just, you know, understanding of all the complexity that, um, uh, that, that the story contains, because I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not black and white as Andrew Young says, who's in the book, you know, I don't want to give away too much, but Andrew Young is in the book, but he, one of the comments that he made with respect to the assassination was it's not black and white, it's gray, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's very true that, um, so much of history, so much of understanding of, you know, a historical figure of a family member of a city, mm -hmm. um, of a culture. There's so much gray. There's so much complexity. There's so much light and shadow there. And so this book really helped me to, to appreciate that and understand that. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up because in that chapter, you know, everybody's guilty, everybody's innocent. And this is a, a, a book about the gray, right? There, as you mentioned, there is no black, there is no white. It's not as, as clear cut as we would hope it to be, or we would think it to be, or need it to be, but we have to get comfortable in those gray areas and wrestling with the both and. And that's something that I really took away from your book as well. Yes, um, that's right. I mean, there is so much unknown. I mean, as time goes on, Evidence, you know, usually doesn't get better. It gets worse <laughs> with regard to a crime. So, you know, as far as the uncertainty around what exactly happened with the assassination, you know, mm -hmm. um, that is something that remains rather, I mean, we know that James Earl Ray was convicted of that murder. There mm -hmm. are certain um, strange facts that have not, to my mind, been settled about it. Mm -hmm. But um, having to live with the ambiguity of that, um, yeah. you know, I think that that speaks to, um, I guess, the the need for all of us to really kind of accept a certain amount of ambiguity in our understanding of the world that we're not necessarily going to be able to get clear cut answers to get, you know, like the, you know, Google answer to you know, every question <laughs> of life. And so it's more about understanding themes. It's more about understanding the questions mm. to be asked. And I think also, you know, uh, to uh, quote Andrew Young again, but he said that, and I agree with this so much that, you know, the main thing, and I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, it's not so much who killed Dr. King, but we know what killed Dr. King. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so profound. It was white supremacy that killed Dr. King. Mm -hmm. um, it was um, violence in this culture <laughs> that killed Dr. King and in society. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I just think that there's so much mystery, there's so much ambiguity and, you know, part of, um, I think being human is, is appreciating that and, and accepting that and knowing what we can and knowing when, you know, something might just not necessarily get a clear answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you mentioned, for many of these questions, you know, we won't get a clear answer for a variety of different reasons. There may not be a truth with a capital T, but I think what's important about your book is it gives us more information so we can start to kind of again, come to our own understanding with as much kind of data, as much context, as many voices as we can, and not just have these very slim kind of versions of history, but rather we can start to wrestle with that ambiguity. Because I think that's when we're actually able to think about, okay, well, what is it that we want moving forward? What are solutions? And how can we also stay focused on these bigger systems of power and oppression that we can actually do something about today. We might not know the answers to some of these historical moments, but these bigger themes that continue to be present in our lives, we can do something about them now. That's exactly right. Because, you know, we are now in a moment of history where once again, you know, there's great social unrest. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, violence. I mean, we recently came out of January 6th. There are, I mean, at this moment, there are, you know, sort of these kind of threats being made, you know, uh, for uh, violence, um, you know, because of political um, and judicial uh, proceedings. And so, 
you know, I think that there are themes that definitely carry over from that moment of the late sixties to today. And I think it's, it's so valuable to have that understanding mm -hmm. of, um, you know, and, and, and really ask those questions, you know, of, you know, what does it mean? What does freedom look like and how do we get there? And, you know, can we get there, you know, the way that we're going, what do we need to be, what do we need to be doing? What needs to change? Mm, yeah, really big questions. And even in your book, what I, I like is that you're taking us through this journey of making those parallels and making those connections from the past, thinking about, you know, in this the civil rights era of the 60s, um, and then also making them to present day as well. And you interspersing kind of your own reflections in present day alongside of these historical moments. And so I think it gives readers a lot to consider um, and a lot to take away and apply in our everyday lives and not just as a, oh, this is a story about history. I mean, it is, but history is always present. Yes, it sure is. And I think that, you know, history is the context of today. And if we're looking at, you know, what's happening now in a vacuum, we'll never understand mm -hmm. what's going on <laughs> and what it means. So I think history is so key to really making sense of the moment and being able to, you know, begin to chart a way forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, let's take another short break. You're listening to Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR 91.7 FM. This is Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR 91.7 FM. I'm Sanaa, and this morning we're talking with Lita mccullough Seletsky, author of The Kneeling Man, My Father's Life as a Black Spy Who Witnessed the Assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., now, Lita, one thing that, again, I just have to say I love so much about the book was I felt I was learning so much about Memphis um, as I was reading the book. Um, and something that you mentioned, you know, you have this great conversation with Kobe Smith, who was a member of the Invaders, and he brings up, um, you know, talking about different pioneers in the struggle for civil rights here in Memphis. And, and what really struck me was he starts talking about how Memphis, you know, was running people out of town, you know, Ida B. Wells, um, Robert Church, and, you know, other activists. And that really struck me because your book, I think, is also a story about Memphis and the ways that we have progressed or the ways that we have stalled as well. Um, and, you know, even I think earlier in the book, when you're talking to Ambassador Andrew Young, um, you have this reflection and you say, if, um, if Young was right that Atlanta's development reflected King's spirit, then what spirit did Memphis's reflect? And that always struck me um, as a Memphian who has felt a deep pride and love for our city, but also someone who's seen these other cities around us really grow and grow and grow. And for me personally, I felt like there has been like a, a depressive spirit on the city um, that I, you know, again, personally do connect back to the assassination of, of Dr. King here. And I'm just wondering if you could kind of share your thoughts on what do you think the spirit of Memphis is? Yes. Um, and I, I agree with you. I feel that, first of all, I love the city. To me, Memphis, first of all, I feel like Memphis could be said to be a character in the book you know memphis to me is yeah. you know that's where i come from that's where my roots are and um i love it and i think that there's so much there there's such a rich culture there's such a rich history even the location you know right on the mississippi river and so it's hard for me to understand, you know, with all that we have all the creativity all of the you know brilliance why do we seem to stall in certain areas? And, you know, it's really hard to say. It's such a complicated, you know, array of issues. And I think, you know, it implicates a lot of things. It impl I, I do agree with you that some of this does come back to the assassination mm -hmm. um, and sort of the picture of the city that was painted um, in the media, but also I think our feelings about ourselves and our mm -hmm. feelings about our own community. I think that we are wounded still by that. Um, I also think that 
uh, probably state politics come into play. Oh, kind yeah. of the dynamics <laughs> are a big part of it. You know, there are economic questions. Um, there are also, I think, you know, there are forces in the city, you know, just like in every community there, Mm -hmm. there are people who want change and there are people who are resisting, you know, there are people who want to maintain the status quo. Mm -hmm. There are people who they, you know, they actually having a, you know, an economically vibrant, you know, diverse community Mm -hmm. is not necessarily their priority. You know, I used to think that money was the primary motivator of most people. I don't think that anymore. Mm. I think that, you know, there are people who value their own dominance above even being more prosperous financially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as, as you mentioned, in the book, Memphis really does become its kind of own character in this storyline. And for Memphians now, you know, Memphis is a a big big part of our own personal storyline. And, you know, we have to know our history in order to make, you know, some movements going forward. And so I think what the book does is really give us some of that history and help us consider, you know, some of the forces, just as in the time period that you're kind of focused on in the book, historically, those same forces are at play, whether it's different types of leadership, where whether it's choices about um, economic advancement in our city. And for me, Again, making those connections between past and present, um, I think it gave me a better understanding of even how I think about the city now and some of the decisions that I see being made. Um, As I said, the book is, you know, it gives us a sense of what was happening at that time in history. But for readers and particularly for Memphians, I think it will not be difficult to make some of those connections to how the city is now and maybe even thinking about where we see um, history repeating itself as well. Yes, absolutely. And again, it just comes back to this idea of um, context, you know, Mm -hmm. and we can't just look at, you know, current facts kind of detached from what they arose out of. And, you know, I really had a lot of fun learning about the history of the city, um, a lot that I didn't know. And, Mm -hmm. you know, even the the history of the Memphis police and how they started out, you know, and it's just, it's really fascinating. And it gave me a new appreciation for the city and what we have come through and come out of. And that, you know, there's so much hope. There's so much there. And, um, you know, I, I will always root for my, my city. (laughs) Absolutely. Look, absolutely. I understand that. Now I know for, um, for you in writing this book, I could imagine it was very, um, a healing process for you just personally, but even thinking about your family too, overall. And we talked earlier a little bit about like one of the themes and threads in the book is about identity, but also about legacy. So I'm wondering, you know, What do you see as the legacy um, for this book, whether for for you, your family, your father in particular? Yeah, I think that um, it's it's a layered legacy for the book, I think, which kind of mirrors sort of the um, layered nature of the story. Mm -hmm. So there's the personal piece of this, you know, the legacy of, you know, now having a book that answers the questions that I had about who is my father? What kind of person is he? I think if you read that story, you will know, you know, that he is a man of, uh, as I said, honor. He's a man Mm -hmm. of, of duty and he's a man of faith. So, um, and I think, uh, for the family, this is a piece of our history that, anyone can look at and say, you know, this, this is one of, you know, I mean, now he's, he's the last surviving um, uh, member of that household from Tibbs, Mississippi in 1944. Mm -hmm. Out of the 12 siblings, he's the only one who remains alive. And so he is a patriarch. Mm -hmm. So anyone, you know, in our family can look at this book and say, this is our patriarch, Mm -hmm. which I think is hugely important. But then, Beyond that, I think it's bigger than us. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than him. And it's bigger than our family. You know, um, for the city, this is um, 
you know, something that people in the city can look at just to gain more of an understanding of the city and for this country. Um, I think that these, what's contained in this book are puzzle pieces that weren't there before Mm -hmm. of the telling of these histories. Um, And so in that sense, uh, for American history and world history, it fills in some, um, some silences there as well. Yeah. I mean, I think that piece of like filling in those silences of history is so key. I know um, in an in another interview you did, you talked about being a custodian of a fragment of history. And I thought that was so beautiful. I mean, these stories have to be not just told, but also entered into the historical record, right? Which I think is is key because there are a lot of stories that maybe we hear from family members or community members, but they haven't been documented in the way that you're able to do in this book. And so those stories end up falling off of the historical record and we are much poorer for it. So this book, I think I, I really see it as... Um, I don't want to say a rewriting of of history, but a correcting of the historical record. Yes, that's exactly something that I want to um, achieve with this book because, you know, and I think this is kind of reflected in my own understanding of my father's role. When you have silences, you know, you've got these vacuums of information and, you know, what fills in those spaces often is sort of... um, fear or, you know, misinformation or even disinformation. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, I think that by, by filling in those silences, um, I think that we get a more, definitely get a more accurate picture of the history and a better understanding of who we are, where we are and how we got here. Mm, Yes. So important. And the book is just, it's really an enjoyable read as far as your writing, your approach to writing, your voice in this book. It really took me on a journey. I was very much, um, you know, in Mississippi with your father, right? Thinking, and I, even as I was writing notes in the margin, I'm like rooting for him um, in some of the different places along his career. And also like having these questions like, oh my goodness, I'm rooting for this, you know, CIA agent. <laughs> Um, But, you know, rooting for him because, again, thinking about the time in which your dad is achieving all this as a Black man, these are accomplishments, you know, and very important ones. And so all that to say, you wrote a story that very much captured me in those moments, but also gave me a lot of places where I was, you know, having questions and and rethinking what I knew. And I think that's, you know, the mark of any really great book that it it makes us feel something, but also gives us another lens to understand our world. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And then, I mean, this kind of goes back to the first point of, you know, what we have to feel. Yeah. Because I think that a lot of understanding is beyond intellectual matters. It goes down to the feeling, you mm-hmm. know, and I, I think that, you know, I, I think I had to feel so much that was uncomfortable yeah. and it's that discomfort that drives the silences. People don't want to talk about things that are uncomfortable or that are traumatic. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that, um, in feeling something and feeling that discomfort that actually allows us to have a greater understanding, you know, with breaking the silences comes discomfort, but I think with that discomfort comes understanding. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for breaking that silence in your own family, but ultimately sharing that with us as well. It has been such a pleasure to talk with you this morning. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you again to Lita McCullough Seletsky for joining us this morning. She's the author of The Kneeling Man, My Father's Life as a Black Spy Who Witnessed the Assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. This book, phenomenal. The storytelling, the way that she's telling these reflections and this narrative of her father's life, but also, the, of course, the information in in this book, very important as a Memphian who loves to learn more about our city, to understand our past in order to understand where we are and where we're headed. I found this book so important. 
Um, that's the kneeling man, my father's life as a black spy who witnessed the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. There are so many different themes and storylines in this book. Our conversation this morning was a very, very tiny fraction of what's in the book and the multiple different ways this conversation could have gone. One thing that stuck out for me in the book and that I wanted to share with you, she writes in the in the book on page 142, she says, if I couldn't love Memphis, then I couldn't love myself. And again, as a Memphian, as someone who grew up here, as someone who came back here and is still here and calls Memphis home, you know, that really resonated with me. I know sometimes as Memphians, we might have a, a, a little bit of a love-hate relationship with our city for a lot of different reasons. But in the end, um, if, if your roots are here, if you are here, you know, if you can't love Memphis, then you can't love yourself. Oh, those words are just so powerful. For today's positive note, I wanted to leave you with something that Lita said, which is how we have to learn to really live in the uncertainties and the ambiguities. And I think that's just an important lesson for us all, uh, regardless of maybe our family's history and what we're wrestling with or with the, the city's history or even our nation's history. We have to learn to settle into the discomfort because it's out of that discomfort that we can actually grow and let's all grow together um, towards some some positive good well this is let's grab coffee on wyxr 91.7 fm i'm sana and i'm here every monday morning talking to experts from across the country who are investigating our most pressing social issues and common curiosities i'm betting that many of you have been curious about who that man was kneeling off over Dr. King's body. And now you know just a little bit about who he was. Well, I hope you join me back here next Monday morning. And of course, if you want to listen to this episode again or listen to some previous conversations, make sure you are subscribed to Let's Grab Coffee in podcast format, available wherever you stream podcasts. I can't wait to be back here with you next Monday morning. <laughs>